Go for hey it. everybody, this is the Pert Show. I'm uh, the uh, what am I? The celebrity guest, I guess. Uh, celebrity ghost, uh, ghost host. I'm doing really well so far, aren't I? <laughs> You're doing perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's funny because I've uh, heard you do a couple of interviews in the last few weeks. Uh, and I always wanted to interview you, too, because I don't like hogging the mic. Uh, so I shot you a bunch of questions and I thought it would be fun if uh, I just picked your brain for a while and asked you a bunch of stuff that no one really asks or thinks to ask you. That sounds sounds awkward and fun. <laughs> let's let's give this a shot. I, I don't understand. Nobody's going to want to listen to this, but thank you very much for teeing it up. Yeah, we'll, we'll have some laughs. Don't worry about it. Uh, sure. I did send you a list of questions of where I would be headed, but I'm going to throw you a curveball first. Is uh, oh beautiful. I want you and I are both big fans of Henry Rollins. Yes, absolutely. Uh, do you want to uh, explain to the viewers who Henry Rollins is for those who don't know? Oh man, uh, yeah, Henry Rollins. I mean, he he kind of has multiple careers. So originally, I think uh, I would call a classic punk musician, but also spoken word kind of. He was a writer. He did uh, tours where he would uh, with Black Flag, certainly where he did music, but also uh, he would do these uh, not stand up exactly. It was more kind of life experience sessions, and those were always really yeah. cool to listen to. Um, and then yeah. he became an actor, and things changed. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, I. Uh... I'm curious how you came across him because uh, whenever I meet someone that's really into Henry Rollins, it's like usually a good bet that we align on a lot of things because you can't be thoughtless. If you're a Henry Rollins fan, you can't be weak. You can't be dumb. You have to be curious. You have to be slightly aggressive in a healthy way. You know, the Henry Rollins crowd is sort of like the uh, retired punk crowd where they're still a little bit angry, but hopefully yeah. uh, more well adjusted right now. Like, like Henry is. I hope so. Um, I, I mean, it's it's funny. I, I've mentioned this to people recently, and I think people who have a view of him from the last 10 years, they they have a very different impression of, yeah. of what he's about. But uh, you go back and read some of his books. I mean, they were raw is, is the thing. I mean, he was <laughs> yeah. he did these experiences. And I, I catch myself saying things every now and then that I clearly are coming from the memory hole of like 25 years ago. Um, you know, I, yeah. I will always think it's it's the rock chicks, it's C-H-I-X chicks. Yeah, I go to that one a lot, too, when I'm drunk. I'm talking about rock chicks. Yeah, or, exactly. Uh, and, and so there's these little things like that. But I, I think I, um, University of Colorado, I think, was where I, I saw him. I know at a college campus um, and he was yeah. doing one of his spoken word bits. And, and yeah. I've seen a bunch of those. I've seen less of his music, uh, actually. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, I really wanted to like his music. I mm -hmm. really I bought all of his records and I tried even on the word I say records now instead of CDs or albums, because that's how Henry used to say it. Like people think I'm yep. some kind of boomer, but it's I'm yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I bought some of his records and I really tried to get into his stuff. And I, I found his spoken word very intelligent. I found his lyrics pretty sophomoric. And I, I totally don't know agree. what the disconnect is. And uh, I, I did see an interview with him. It was over 10 years ago where someone is saying they're fanboying out on him. And they're like, man, no one appreciates your music. One day everyone's going to get it. And he pushes back and he goes, I don't I don't think so. I, I don't yeah. play an instrument like I'm a I'm an archivist of music is he sort of knows what he is. Is what I'm trying to say. I think he's somebody who's, he, he seems comfortable with himself. And I, I completely agree with you. I, I never could fully get into his music, um, even when he had the kind of resurgence later where it was uh, Rollins yeah. Band. And, and I think Liar was probably his big, his big quote unquote hit. Yep. Um, but it never, it always felt very amateur. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I found him, I became an atheist and uh, I was needing something to. I needed a new ethos, basically, and I ran into him right at the right time. I bought a, a Henry a Rollins band record, and I accidentally bought a spoken word, not knowing that they were different. And I put yeah. in, you know, Big Ugly Mouth or whatever it was, and I'm just like, this isn't music. But I'm like, this isn't really comedy either. It's just, I thought spoken word was comedy for people that aren't funny all the time. It was like an artsy way of saying <laughs> kind of comedy. Yeah. And uh, yeah, for me, it just took off there, just like his aggressive attitude, his intelligent way of looking at things. And I was putting in some old, uh, like, uh, uh, stuff like Get in the Van and Big Ugly Mouth. And, like, he would absolutely be canceled if he said some oh, yeah. of those things today. Like, I think 100%. he dropped the N-word once. And he did it for a reason. He wasn't just being racist, but he did drop the N-word. And some other stuff from 1984, which was okay back then, but now not so much. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm looking over at my shelf here and I've got some of the books up there and, and it would never fly today. And mm -hmm. I think he's he's made comments like, well, I was I, I mean, that almost disappointed me of, of almost turning his back a little bit on the stuff from before that, you know, I shouldn't have said some of those things, but he absolutely should mm -hmm. have. I mean, it was the right 
tone yeah. and, and the right thing. And I, I, he had a lot of good lessons. He, he was a very pragmatic guy uh, yeah. in a lot of ways. I think I, definitely a lot of my life, I think yeah. he was an influence. Yeah. I noticed in his new stuff, he doesn't swear at all anymore. And I have not found yeah. an interview that explains why or what changed. Not that like, I carry the way. I was just curious, you know. He he just he seemed to flip, and it's it was a shame. I, I again, I, I think if you go back and you look at some of those old books, uh, you'd be shocked, especially if you think you know who kind of the guy is now. But yeah. how much that stuff is still completely on point today of yeah. Yeah. human behavior and everything else. But yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah that's uh, that's cool. It's one of the things we have in common for sure. Yeah. Well, now that we lost everybody for the ten percent who actually know who Henry Rollins is. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, let me get to these questions here. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how old are you? Mid forties? Yeah, mid, uh, mid to late forties. Yeah, getting closer to the late, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, you owned a shop in the nineties. You must have been like eighteen years old. When that happened, right? Um, yep. Yep. Uh, eighteen. Eighteen. I want to say eighteen. Yeah. It was. It was young. And and the thing is, I, I think a lot of people now look at that and they go, uh, they can't even imagine how that would be. But you, you could do it, especially in a smaller city. And I mean, it wasn't a small city where I started the first shop down in, in Colorado, but yeah. it was, uh, you, you could, you could do it at that age. And comics was one of those businesses you could step into. And I, I bear no mistake. I had help from my parents for sure, who wanted, I think they were thrilled to support me in doing something that wasn't yeah. going to be, you know, getting people pregnant. So, you know, <laughs> comic books or shops are excellent for avoiding that. Yeah. Um, you quickly, you mentioned your parents, uh, mm -hmm. you come from a, what kind of background do you come from? Uh, my parents were educators. Uh, I would, but I think so, you know, poor, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, <laughs> you know, not I, like you. No, 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 no. Uh, but I think, uh, they were, you know, they, they were modest people. They, they, you know, they didn't, they, they liked, you know, books and readings and all that stuff. So comic books were a good way to, to go about it. And, and I think they, you know, they, it was never kind of this rich family. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, we, we appreciated what we had. Yeah. Did they give you the uh, fundamentals of business? You seem to have a pretty st strong background. So I think they gave me common sense and um, yeah. I think they did a really good job with that. The business, I think I picked up and, and a lot of it came a, I, I don't know, I was fascinated by why people did the things they did. And I think that mm -hmm. led me to business. So if you're going to operate a store and, you know, do this kind of thing, I mean, I mean, I'm finishing high school, I'm hiring people, yeah. in, you know, and, and the thing you do not want to deal with with your, when you're that age is having to fire somebody because they're stealing from you and these kinds of things. So you learn like, okay, yeah. this is how I'm going to assess the business and project where we're going. And, you know, right. I will also say in the early nineties, it was easy to make money in comics. Like it was the perfect moment to, you know, be an idiot and still make money. Yeah. I recall, uh, I grew up in Derry, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. which had three comic shops and a bunch of sports card places. And some of them overlapped yeah. and, um, they all went under after the crash, like pretty quickly. You could see who had heard that, Oh, there's wealth here. And they started the store and then it's just capsized. Yeah. And I, I would say I, I, it was a hobby and it also, it was so easy to fall into and capital city was a distributor I first used and they were great because they, hmm. they made it very easy to step into it and you didn't have to order a ton and they weren't kind of the nightmare yeah. that was diamond. So it was, it was very easy to do. I, I mean, honestly, there wasn't a, it, it became much harder in the mm -hmm. late nineties for sure. Did you buy a shop that was already up and running or did you have to go from scratch? And completely did you come from up with some scratch. Kind of um, yeah, com completely. But what I did was I went around to kind of flea markets and things and I, I basically got a loan of, you know, yeah. $8,000 and just bought up a ton of stock. And, and the original idea was just, I wasn't even looking for specific things. I was looking at just volume, something that would look good when the store, yeah. like there's a lot of comics here. Um, so that was the back issue stock. And then new issues, as I mentioned, Capital City was really easy to get you going. And Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was not that hard. I having read comics and enjoyed comics, I knew what people were interested in, what they liked. And I think I had yeah. a good sense of what the community wanted. So but perch, that's, that's amazing, but that's, that's psychotic. I mean, 18 year olds don't seem old enough to have driver's licenses these days <laughs> to, to like go and get a business and to, to do all these things and to have payroll and uh, insurance and all that. I mean, yeah. that's amazing. It, 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 it seems more amazing now. I mean, back then it was pretty, it was, it wasn't that, that big a deal. And I think people were exiting high school and just opening up, you know, garages yeah. and other things they could do. So it, I, I, today I think it would be incredibly hard for somebody to do that. Uh, but 
yeah. you know, a business license for like, I don't know, it was like 25 bucks. And my rent in the first shop I was in was, I, I want to say $350 a month. It was nothing. I mean, it was and, very easy. And you had employees from the uh, get go? I did. Yeah. I had to have, uh, and, and it started like everything with friends who are going to come in. And that, that was one of the first mistakes I made was you, you bring somebody in who's a, a friend and you're going to kind of pay them this unofficial amount of money. Yeah. And within two months, it was like, nope, we're going to need to report. <laughs> taxes yeah. and payroll and yeah. I can't do it that way. And that was a, that was a tough lesson for sure. Now, did you uh, hire a diverse staff, including a black, a Jew, an Asian, someone who's trans um, <laughs> people of that nature? I, you know, no, um, not <laughs> racist. I, I, I absolutely. <laughs> yes. I, it was, you know, I, it was funny though. One of the first employees was uh, Latino and gay and it was, it, we got to go through, I mean, there's like these stories in a story, and yeah. uh, he, we got to watch him uh, come out of the closet. Uh, everybody else who worked in the store knew from the very beginning, but we watched yeah. him go through this very torturous process of telling us. And it was, I, <laughs> I, I remember this moment of like, everybody's like, all right, we're going to be supportive of you. We all knew like, yeah, you know, what you're saying is surprising at all, but uh, we are here yeah. for you. Yeah. He was great. He was one of the better employees I, I had. But. I heard you mention him on your uh, shows from time to time. Um, yeah. now, what was the tell? Was he a big North star fan or was it more, uh, Harder to spot. And I mean, it was that he would talk about how attractive men were. I mean, <laughs> it was like, it wasn't, it, it, it was, it was hilarious when he came out to us. Cause we were like, Oh, I thought this happened a long time ago. Cause you yeah. like to talk about, you know, I mean like he, he, this is like the, that time yeah. where he, was, he could be like, ah, oh, man, I, I love, I was watching Rambo and I love it when his shirt's off. I'm like, uh, <laughs> well, me too. Cool. But it's funny when straight guys have man crushes, it's like, I have a man crush on Hugh Jackman because, you know, in my my male power fantasies, that's what I look like. I don't want to fuck Hugh Jackman. That's the difference. <laughs> that's the difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it, it's, man, so many of these conversations were, were just in the 90s, running a shop was so easy. You didn't have any of this stuff. There was no diverse yeah. hiring. It was just like, who's going to be good for the shop? And it just worked out. I think my staff yeah. probably was pretty diverse. Um, based on yeah. where I was in Colorado, there was a lot of Latino people who had work there and yeah it was fine nobody nobody commented on any of it yeah that's funny my sister works in Vail in uh, uh real estate and uh the f- economy would not function without illegal mexican workers period no, no and she's uh leaning more republican these days and she still is very much an advocate for immigration and, and all that stuff just knowing her local environment and how they could not get by without yeah. cheap cheap wine cheap labor all that oh, stuff. I mean, uh, Vail. Well, I mean, everybody who lives in Vail for any length of time is going <laughs> to be a Republican sooner or later. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, no. It, it, a lot of these these middle, you know, states are uh, in sometimes very conservative, but also they. I mean, their business model depends on immigrants. So what are you yeah. going to do? A quick uh, side note on Vail. I remember reading a Rob Liefeld Young Bug Young Blood book where a uh, Bedrock or Bad Rock was skiing in Vail, <laughs> and I had just been there as a kid, and I remember thinking that is. Rob Liefeld has not been to Vail. It yeah. does not look like this at all. And I know that Rob Liefeld can afford to go to Vail. And it just kind of yeah. threw me off. Uh, that was the first bit of doubt I had in Youngblood. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious, actually. <laughs> I, uh, Vail is what did you in Rob Liefeld. It was <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, um When you watched the Clerks, the whole uh, conversation yeah. between about like Death Stars and Stormtroopers, was that... At the time, did that remind you of like, oh, it's kind of like owning a shop? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, my shop anyway, that was a kind of nonsense. Yeah. And that's why this entire channel and the conversations, and maybe it's the perspective of we see these these fights start up on social media that are very personal and very heated. And it's yeah. like, I don't know, for 30 years, it was Superman versus the Hulk, who's going to win. And that that conversation would go on for like eight hours. Right. Um, I always actually hate it when people got really into a, a very intense conversation early in the day because- mm-hmm people would leave and new people would come in and then they would just join. It would be the forever argument that would, just, Oh my God. That was the it's argument of the day. What was one of the big ones? Uh, who's that character that couldn't be moved? Was it puck? Oh, uh, had, well the blob, the, the unmovable object, the blob. blob. So blob yeah. versus juggernaut who yeah. would win that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, they, this would go on and on and on. And <laughs> I, I, I mean, I remember people like hold this argument and then like the guy would go out and run to the little Caesars. It was across a little mini mall and then bring pizza in so they could just continue the fight. And I'm sitting there like, please buy something. But, wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you owning a shop, what, what mistakes did you make and what were you good at? 
well, the mistake definitely like the hiring uh, for sure. And this is the, yeah. you, you hire your friends and you want to keep it kind of not off the books. We weren't thinking of it that way. Just, you know, people who want to get paid in comics. It's, it's a bad plan. Everybody hates the rules, but yeah. uh, the second you start messing with them, it goes wrong fast. Um, and I, I just kept, I've, I've continued to learn that mistake. I like to think the, despite everything on my channel, I like to think the best out of people and yeah. you know, they usually fail at that. So, <laughs> um, you know, the, the best thing I did, I, I think the, the thing that, that caused me to survive in the nineties and, and actually helped with, with wealth and everything else was just being very maniacal about the numbers and mm -hmm. it sounds nerdy and it is, but yeah. just really getting a sense of what people are buying and what they're not buying. That was the, you know, all the other stores had tons of stock and they collapsed and I was able to mm. manage that a lot better than most. Um, you know, you're a very inter easy interview because I think you're a good storyteller. I think you're good at hitting the bullet. <laughs> like I can tell that whatever you do in your day job, you're pretty good in a meeting. You're pretty good at the living room sale if you have to. Uh, that geez. kind of thing. Well, yeah, yeah, you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're <laughs> fine. I, I mean, it is storytelling, right? It's, it's you gotta if you're if you're trying to win somebody over with an idea, you gotta give them some yeah. to get it there. So I, I hope so. I try and make people laugh and dance. Yeah. I, I love your interviews. But some of them are so much one-sided of this person just keep going on without interruption. And my fear is I don't ever want to be that guy. And I'm not, no criticism to people that, that think and talk that way. I mean, we're a bunch of introverts. That's going to happen. But oh, I sure. always appreciate people that can, you know, you know, hit the ping pong back every now and then and have it be more of a parlay. I, I, that's why I like talking to you. It's always a good conversation. We're, um, <laughs> we're going to do it. We're going to connect up in, uh, in Seattle and do the, you know, yeah. do like a show from a bar or something. That'll be great. Yeah, we're going to put a bag over your head. I'll have drawn mm -hmm. a face on it and I'll rip it off. Or we'll do something even more clever than that to do the yeah. big face reveal. Or underneath, you'll be wearing another mask and you, we that won't actually exactly what we'll do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we should do that. We, we need to do the reveal. The reveal, this whole lack of a face, I mean, it, it was unintentional. There was no, people sometimes ask like, <clears> when, <throat> oh, you're the mystery. It was, I, if yeah. I'm going to record a video in the car, I don't even know how the video would work. So... Yeah, <laughs> that's what you got. Um, so next topic, um, mm, you talk yeah. a lot about meeting pros at conventions and getting inside access to a certain degree. How do you manage to work your way in with somebody like Chris Claremont? I, uh, well, I don't know. I'm that in with Claremont, but I think, uh, but it, you know, the biggest thing, if you're watching people, uh, most of the, the pros, I'm not sure all of them, but you know, they typically just want to be treated like a normal human being and not have yeah. weird, awkward conversations. So I, I, if I'm seeing somebody get mobbed, I'm not going to go over there and join that mob. And if they start to kind of peel off and, you know, they're alone, I'm not going to go over there and, and restart the whole thing again. So I, I just try and say, Hey, you, you know, you need a drink or, yeah. you know, I've taken water to pros before of somebody who's clearly just can't get up off the table. And I'm like, here's, here's something to drink. Your assistant's not helping you out, but here's, here's something for you. And I just try and treat people like I would want to be treated if I was in that situation. And it seems yeah. to work. Yeah, no, I, I struck the same, I had the same idea when I was younger and getting started. My friend was the Altoid guy. He would always yeah. have Altoids on him. And at a party, everyone needs an Altoid. No one ever dislikes someone that offers them a mint. And uh, you'd be surprised how simple that is. Um, as long as you don't smell really bad, you bent, you have that funk on you. If you have some kind of hygiene. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was definitely an in because a lot of uh, creators are being asked to do things the whole time. Rare is it when someone comes up and offers them something for free just to be nice. And you, you totally see them like blink out of their haze and be like, oh, my oh my God, thank you so much for this water. You know? Yeah, for sure. And and I think, you know, and this is tough because I think a lot of, of people, the customers, the fans coming to the conventions, they they want to hear many of them have the same question. Like, what's it like to what's it like to draw Batman? <laughs> <laughs> and as much as you can restrain yourself, like don't ask the same question that everybody's heard 50,000 times before, you know, go look it up on YouTube. They probably answered mm -hmm. it there. Um, go in with something else. And, and, you know, if yeah. you're going to fawn over the person, have it be legit. Uh, mm -hmm. don't, you know, the yeah. second you give somebody the impression that you're fluffing them, uh, you're, you're, you're yeah. love bombing them, if you will. Oh man. What's love bombing? I um, have no idea really. Um, what are some tips for getting pros to lower their guard and chat openly? Maybe you already answered some of yeah, this. Yeah, is that don't be weird. I know that sounds maybe too flippant, yeah. but just just you know, 
it, it, it's a careful balance, you know, don't go and ask them the exact same things you've asked them a million times before. Don't also go super personal. I've watched fans come up and be like, so what kind of, uh, what's your favorite sexual position? That's a terrible idea as an opener. Yeah. Don't, don't ask that. <laughs> um, you know, no. Uh, and, and if you see a pro at a bar, you know, it's okay, it, you know, or, or whoever, and, and this isn't just for creators, it'd be anybody in the world, uh, you know, go up if you want and you really want to say hi, say hi, but then make yourself scarce. Don't just hang out and make it weird for them. Make them move. Yeah. When I was, uh, when I teach younger guys uh, and girls, I, I say when you're at a bar, I, mostly this is something that I tell men, guys, you're way taller and more broad than most women are in a bar. You're mm-hmm. talking to a female at a comic convention. Don't box her in. Like stand yeah. so that your elbow is touching her elbow. So you're both looking out across the bar. Don't box her up against anything. Like you don't realize how, you know, Literally. women don't like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, yeah. Stay nobody, out of their personal space. Don't box them in. Try to be cool. Nobody wants to be trapped. I mean, in anything, yeah. and 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 definitely in these conventions. I mean, keep in mind, it's it's hard. A lot of uh, fans they go to the convention and they're like, oh, I got to take a break for a couple hours because it's so tough to be in this hall and and kind yeah. of the sound and all the rest. Well, keep in mind, most of those creators are are not leaving for maybe mm-hmm. eight hours, and so right. you know, if you see them later, don't try and recreate that experience for them, for God's sake. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, um, well, when you do the face reveal, you're going to be a big celebrity too in comics. No, uh, I doubt that. No, enjoy no. your anonymity while it lasts. Once it's gone, Perch, <laughs> it's gone forever. Nobody, I, 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 I'm a nobody. I, I mean, it's, it's fun doing this channel and, and everything else, but maybe I'm massively misjudging it, but I, I know what, yeah. what if Claremont sees you and he's like, Oh, here comes the Altoid guy. Wait a minute. That's Perch. He's got that podcast where he talks yeah. about me and he talks about how easy it was for him to buddy up against me. I don't think I want to drink from this guy. That's true. It could happen. I, uh, <laughs> like maybe I the face reveal, any, you know, go ahead. I, don't, I don't know why people haven't put more of it together. I mean, I, I don't, I think my voice is fairly <laughs> recognizable, but I, I also don't think I, I don't look like my voice, which probably, uh, is yeah. 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 I don't know. I mean, if someone really, really wanted to hire an assassin to kill you and find out who you were, they probably could do it. I mean, how many comic book shops are in the Seattle area? I mean, it wouldn't take that much of a, a thing. Yeah. Not that I'm trying to give anybody any ideas here. Yeah, don't don't take any ideas. From this. <laughs> no, people have, people have narrowed it down. I know people have mailed me, and and there's been some people I've I've interviewed, and they've gone, "Oh, it's you," and it's like, "Yeah, yeah. It's me." Yeah. So I I don't um, know. I don't. I'd like to think I'm not saying crazy, insane stuff, and I also like to think I'm not that popular. So hopefully, both those things are true. No, I, I think that the, you probably get attacked for the same reason I do, where where I'm generally a liberal. I am I skew towards the center these days because I'm willing to look at both sides. I like to be challenged. I have Republican friends that I really like to listen to, and I, I like to know where Democrats are getting it wrong. Mm-hmm. To talk like you're on the fence at all is just you're in the crosshairs at both for both sides. Yeah, yeah. People don't like it, and and I also think there's a. Uh... I mean, everybody gets worked up about things. I know the, you know, there uh, people sent me these notes saying, "Hey, what are you going to say back to this this guy who's it's, some guy's ripping you for your opinion on Warren Ellis?" By the way, when you send me those mails, you got to tell me who, or if you want me to go watch the video, I have no idea who you're talking about. I can guess somebody, maybe, but yeah. I, I haven't seen the video, but maybe it's out there. Yeah, but, you know, keep in mind there's like what's right and what act, you know, what is the law? They're they're kind of two different things. It's like with Ellis. It's like there, yeah. If you work in a company and you do some of those things, you're probably going to get fired. Mm-hmm. Um, does that make it right? Uh, that's a moral call. That's your call. That's completely different from yeah. <laughs> whatever yeah. the rules are. And and I think people have a hard time dis- distinguishing the two. Yeah. Um, going back to uh, so because when I go to shows, I'm I'm sort of known. I have had it's. I think about what gets my attention as far as oh, this guy's cool. I can trust this guy. I don't even know him, but offering me a bottle of water is a good move. Like, I feel like I have a safe mm-hmm. space with this dude or this girl. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes people I don't know will come up to me, and say my name like they know me and I don't know them. And then they're just suddenly buying me a drink. And I almost like I'm hesitant to be like, oh, did they put anything in it? I sure. look around and my friend's like, do you know that guy? Like, I, I start to get weird. And uh, I don't I don't know. Maybe that's. <laughs> no, I think that's legit. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I knew a guy who uh, is like, I'm going to go to a comic convention and I'm going to pee in the bottle and then <laughs> give that bottle. <laughs> And <laughs> it's like, please don't ever do that. I don't know if he ever went and did that. I hope not. But yeah, you should. Yeah. You know, you should if he does it. that, no one at conventions will ever take a free gift drink from anybody ever again. That story yeah. will spread like wildfire. 
Yeah, please don't <laughs> do that. Please, please don't make it any more stupid than it already is for people. I was in a, I was in Mohegan Sun recently with some friends. I was with Jimmy Palmiotti at the bar, and it's a casino, so most of the people there are not comic book folks, which is fine with me. Mm-hmm. And this kid comes up to me, and he's like, "Hey, how you doing, Sean? Can I get you a drink?" I was like, uh, yeah, I'll take a vodka, whatever. So he goes away and I look to the girl I'm talking to. I'm like, do you know who that guy is? She's like, no. So he sits down he gives me the drink and I'm like, all right, thanks. And I'm like, oh, this guy's annoyed that I don't know who he is. Maybe mm-hmm. he's like a reader that met me a few times. I'm like, oh man, now. And then he's, he's sitting down he's talking to Jimmy for a half hour and someone else and someone else. And finally I put it together. I'm like, oh shit, that's, that's Donnie Cates. <laughs> and uh, I had not seen him for like three years. He showed up at a party and I was like, who's this kid with blonde hair? Uh, whatever. And then someone told me that he was the next big thing and whatever. Like I, I like Donnie. I want to like Donnie. I don't know Donnie very well, but uh, he seemed very annoyed that I didn't know who he was. And I spent the next hour sitting next to him trying to tell him, I'm sorry. I didn't know who he was because he, I didn't see his hair because he was wearing a skull cap. Mm-hmm. So he takes off his skull cap to reveal his hair and he shrugs at me like, what the fuck? You couldn't see my hair? And I'm like, yeah, dude, I don't have x-ray vision. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. He might not like me even to this day. And uh, Donnie, if you're listening, again, I apologize for not knowing who you were. <laughs> it's a bit, I, I've, you know what? That's happened to a bunch of people. And <laughs> like it, you're in a convention with thousands of people. You're meeting people. It's the, everybody works from home. It's not like you go into an office. Like you're, you're not yeah. going to recognize people. I, I mean, you know, I, I, somebody was was making it that missed and not recognize jim starlin and it's like it, you, you it's okay you cannot remember yeah. people it, it's not a big deal but yeah people are very pissed when you don't remember them you know? oh my god yeah i uh i had to meet mike mignola eight times before he he didn't even know my name he just knew that he knew me from somewhere before and yeah. i was okay with that like i even as i was published i never took it personally but then like jason latour got pissed off at me because i had met him three times before and whatever he's out of comics anyway for being canceled <laughs> but, yeah, uh, there's yeah. It, it's tough, I though. Stuck I mean, getting all uppity about that shit i i don't know it's i guess it's all in the personality i i i I can never remember anybody's name. I can remember faces much better than names. And I, I know I've met the same person like 20 times. Like I, I know yeah. you, but I don't remember your name. And I, I people get all yeah. weird about it. It's like, look, I, what do you, yeah. what do you want for me anyway? I'm old and drunk. Yeah. Uh, qu- so quick story. That's co- sort of about all this. And then we'll get back to the interview. I have a reader. I forget his name. He is a Filipino guy from uh, Chicago. I met him and his buddy is a cop. The Filipino guy is a Democrat. The cop is a Republican. The Filipino guy and his wife can't have kids. His buddy, the cop, agreed to have a kid for them. They Mm -hmm. literally live across the street in the same neighborhood. They both love comics. Um, The guy who's his friend, who's a cop, is obviously like Blue Lives Matter and Trump, this and that. And the other guy is like Hillary. Yet they have this like amazing, beautiful, and I've seen their photos, uh, collective family of two people that are on completely different sides of the aisle here and whenever i hear people online getting into these you know pissing contests on twitter i just i almost want them to meet this guy and his buddy cop friend and you explain that to me you people on the left or right like how is this relationship possible in the united states but i would maintain that most relationships in the u.s most people who have real jobs totally understand this because only the crazies are on twitter (laughs) Uh, no absolutely i mean my uh, my grandparents was a diehard. You know, she was a grandmother was a diehard Democrat. Grandfather was a diehard Republican. I mean, they were married, and yeah. they made jokes about going to the polls to cancel each other out every time. And <laughs> it, it just I don't know. They they yeah. stayed married. It worked. So yeah, I don't know. It, Twitter is for terrible people. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I have a couple questions about com- comic conventions for yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, what do you think makes a good comic convention? Fresh air. Uh, no, um, space. <laughs> I, I think space. I, I you know, the, the comic conventions, you, you always, when you go to ones and there's, they, they have it spaced out nicely. They've thought about the foot traffic. They've thought about how people are going to queue up for things. Um, it sounds very logistical, but God, it's so much better. And hmm. I notice the creators are happier. The people you go to meet are just in a better mood because they don't feel like yeah. they're crammed in. Like the uh, Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle is one of those places where they badly need to go somewhere else. It's in this terrible venue that's, tight and cramped and every, I, I noticed by the second or third day everybody's more pissed the creator's unhappy i mean they're, yeah. they're doing their best but nobody wants to be in that tight yeah. smelly zone 
Is that the um, uh, place where it's split into two giant rooms still? Yeah, and, and then some. I mean, that's where they've got the giant escalators, and it's like the sixth floor building. And you, that's, you just, yeah, that's you, it. Yeah, they funnel everybody through this really tight area. And then the last two years ago, the Artist Alley was kind of split into multiple corridors, and it just yeah, you know, if if you have an area where everybody's uncomfortable, then the mood gets bad. The people yeah. are clogging up, and especially now with COVID, I, I don't know what this year is going to be like. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, I was hoping to bump into you in New York, uh, you and Joe, for us to talk and have a, a powwow and talk about business stuff anymore. Yeah. Um, but uh, sadly, you're not able. To, you'll make it. You'll be missed. I'll send you a selfie with me and Joe Carallo. Please do. Yes. I uh, <laughs> no. I'm, I'm going to be. I'm very frustrated because there there is some business for us to talk about. Um. So to push back, I agree that space makes a good convention. However, um, I know a, a few years ago, Heroes Con. Mm. Who, who used to be a really great mom and pop show, which has been suffering in the last, I don't know, few years. They uh, decided to use the entire convention floor in Charlotte instead of the the you know half of it, and they spread out so much that it yeah. looked empty. Like it yeah. was, I saw photos and it looked like no one was there. But the problem was there was like twenty feet in Artist Alley for twenty foot wide, and it, it's there's almost something about squeezing customers closer to tables. They're more likely to spend money, which is actually That's a true. good thing. Yeah, no, that's true. I, I mean, I think you can't make it look desolate. Um, yeah. This con that just went on in, in Puyallup up here in Washington. Uh, I mean, part of it's COVID now, but they're spreading everybody. But the artist alley looked weird because yeah. it was still spread out. And I'm sure yeah. people spent less as, as a result. So I, there's a balance in between. Um, mm. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I think New York does a pretty good job, actually. I think Chicago does a pretty good job. Yeah. It's funny when uh, New York, because that was like, uh, I've been in Brooklyn for a while and that was my home show for a bit. And when they had the uh, side artist alley um, hanger, mm -hmm. people were pissed. Like, oh, we're not as good as Hollywood and PlayStation, so they're just going to stick us over here. This, and then after that first uh, show, it was like, this is amazing. Yeah. Only people who care about comics are coming over here. If you're coming through this hallway, this crazy bottleneck that they are fixing, uh, you're going to spend money. So in a way, it started out being negative, but then at the end, at the end of the day, everybody changed their minds and decided that this was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 and I definitely think there's proof that they spend a lot more money there. Um, in yeah. that format. You get the right customers to the right place. I, I don't really like San Diego. You've been to San Diego, right? Not in 10 years. Okay. Yeah, I try not to go. It used to be a show where you could get work done uh, and make deals, but it just became so incestuous that I, I just didn't have patience for it. Rightly or wrongly, I don't know. I uh, I love the I love everything around the show. I like the gas lamp. I like uh, going mm. to Hard Rock and getting a villa up at the top there, and you can bring people in, and it's a little bit more private. That's a great thing to do. Yeah. Um, but I, I hate the show itself. I, I like everything yeah. around the show. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, what's the uh, rooftop bar there? Is it the Hyatt? Uh, let's see. It was the Ivy, and then I think it became the Andaz. Uh, or, or sorry, do you mean the outdoor or indoor rooftop? Uh, indoor, there was a party where Frank Miller almost accidentally fell off a ledge. That is the, I think that was the Hyatt. It's funny that you um, are kind of already know the story. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, that, never, that, that story went around actually. <laughs> Do you want to tell it? <laughs> no, no, please. By all means. I'm talking to you. Uh, well, I probably heard a third hand, um, but there's a party in San Diego and Frank Miller is sitting on a windowsill near an open window. And it was the type of thing where if he leaned out, he could have just fallen 30 stories or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, he almost dropped something or he almost, he slipped backwards and he caught himself and everybody kind of laughed like, oh, that was close. And then it set in that he almost plummeted to his death. And then the party became very dour after that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, I think that's a show. I don't know if it was that like a year after that, or they, they eventually made it so that you can't, you know, open the windows up because uh, people were chucking stuff out the window, like glasses and things. And yeah. Know. You know, it caused a big, big problem. Comics yeah. always ruin it for everyone. Of course, yeah. I mean, it's like you can't throw pennies off the Empire State Building before they start to put up a, you know, glass wall up or whatever. Which is <laughs> Jack Kirby's fault. I, no, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, the, there's a rooftop bar. It's only about four or five stories up called the Ivy. And it was always, that was always my favorite hotel. It was an overpriced boutique hotel, but it was, it was really nice. Uh, yeah. But they had this rooftop bar with a pool and a big fire pit. And one comic convention, I, I won't say a, a colorist, um, dropped into the like laid down in the fire for reasons mm. best known to to him oh my god um and then people are like trying to put him out but they're throwing their drinks on him and that was you know it's <laughs> alcohol so that wasn't working either it was, here's some 90 prayer like just laughing my ass off. yeah um well last con story were you there when um 
uh, Darwin Cook, rest in peace, picked a fight with a guy, and the guy ended up passing out and falling over and cracking his face on the marble floor. I was at that show. I didn't see that, but I that was okay. the story that went around. Um, yeah, and uh, was it the easiest fight Darwin was ever in? Something like that. He, yeah. he wasn't even fighting. He was just getting mad at the guy. Yeah, and uh, Andy McDonald, who was the artist on NYC Mech, who was a really nice guy, who's more fit, and taller than most pros, stepped in to help. And there was no fight, but his he got his blood worked up so much, getting ready to Hulk out. And then there was no reason for him to Hulk out. So he just passed out. <laughs> and I heard the story from Bob Shrek, my editor at the time in New York. We were chatting and he's like, I think Darwin should pay for his medical bills because <laughs> Darwin could afford it. And I'm not sure if he did or not, but uh, I think I he cracked his jaw. On the, on the, yeah, they called the Coblin and ambulance. It. It's funny because there's a show, um, New York's coming up. I'm leaving tomorrow. And mm-hmm. there's a, I don't know if you've heard uh, Perch, but there's an event called Scottover. Yes, Scottover. When are we getting uh, Sean Vimber? Uh, I don't know if I would allow a company to market me like that because <laughs> I would be so embarrassed. <laughs> I would bet Scott's not loving that. I, I may be wrong, but yeah, I would bet. Well, so so I, I'm, I'm, I can see both sides. If I, I, at first I'm like, that's, and I love Scott. Scott's a friend, but at first I'm like, that's stupid. Why would you call it that? But if Comicsology came to me and they're like, listen, man, we gave you all this money to do eight books. Everyone in our office is super jazzed by this. This is a big deal for us. We mm-hmm. want to throw you a party. We want to call it Sean Tober. We want you to fucking show up. Yeah. As a capitalist, as a leader, I would have to say, okay, sure. But I would try to backpedal that every minute I got. Like, oh, can we invite <laughs> other people? Can we share the spotlight? Like, do we really have to be on a throne with a scepter in the middle of the party the whole time? I, I would have pushed back on it big time. I don't know if Scott is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I, I would, uh, I would have to go wonder. I would try, I would do what you do. I would try to backpedal. I mean, I'll never be in this situation. You, you, you actually, <laughs> there's a chance you will be. So, uh, but if you couldn't backpedal, then I would go hard the other direction. I'd be like, all right, we are going to get a scepter and we are going to get a little thrown here. And I'm going to make this the most awkward thing in the, in the entire world. <laughs> um, I, I'm curious. I, I will see how it, it works. I mean, these, these parties. Yeah. I, I mean, didn't we yeah. just hear about how we shouldn't have, uh, was it uh, the alcohol con? Shouldn't we avoid? Kind no. of that? Like, hmm. Yeah. Good luck. You want to have a dry uh, networking opportunity? Fine. I'll go, but I'm going to be thinking about when can I get a drink? Yeah. Yeah. I well, think it's I a nice idea in fairyland, but I don't, I think Heather Antos is pushing this idea and no offense to Heather who I don't know, but I, I don't think that's going to work. No, that's not what convention, that's not what's been established with conventions. And and everybody who says this, um, they yeah. also love a drink. So, I mean. Yeah. Anybody who goes to DryCon instead of BarCon, DryCon is going to be filled with people that you don't want to work with anyway. 100%. <laughs> so, 100%. Uh, yeah. what are you going to do? It's, uh, it's a long way to solve it, by the way. You, you, people need to be responsible with their alcohol and they need to handle it well. You, you don't yeah. eliminate it completely. We've all learned that lesson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not advocating for pros to just drink whatever they want either like i'm again i'm very much on the fence here um uh last question about conventions uh what is your favorite convention what's your least favorite convention um you know i i i think i mean i i do I, now everything what i just said i do have some great memories of, of san diego from like 15 years ago and, and so yeah. i do love new york uh, there's been some but it's usually the moments in the con. Um, I think some of my least favorite have been up here in Seattle, uh, just because I, I don't know. Maybe it's because it's in the same area. I can go home at night rather than mm. hotels, so there's it. It makes it more business like. I think. Yep. Uh, um, but I had see there was a con in Orlando that was just a miserable fucking time, and I'm trying to remember like it's fully organized Megacon. and everything else. Yeah, is it MegaCon? I think that may have been a mega con. I, I, it seems like they called it something else at the time, like Sunshine Con or something, but it was, it was a, Oh, mess. wow. Yeah. Um, but again, I'm old, so, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, uh, let me see. I used to like heroes con, mm-hmm. but it got weird because they had this, uh, big auction and they had at the first, this auction was to help charity. So you have Adam Hughes and Mark Brooks and these other artists donating these cover quality commissions that were getting like 10 grand at this auction. Um, and when it became such a thing, they started buying everybody Hugh Hefner robes to wear. Mm, and yes. then the next year was like, well, who doesn't have a robe versus who does have a robe? And it became, as you can uh, imagine, a ton of infighting. And then I, I was the only one to ask, actually it was me and Jimmy. They were like, 
uh, all this money that you're getting, is this still going to charity? And the answer turned out to be no. It was going to the promoter. <laughs> and he was just, he had people, uh, I mean, he had, took a photo of himself in first class flying somewhere. And I think that was when a lot of people turned on him. And yeah. uh, what started out as a really generous, good idea, mom and pop show, artist show, turned into something that wasn't as great. And I haven't been back since. And I, 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 I love it if that was a, a good show again. But I haven't been. The other thing, too, is there was only one hotel and one bar. Yeah. And everybody would get liquored up after this uh, auction, pissed off that they didn't make as much money as Mark Brooks. Uh, and then who are you going to run into two hours later while you're sloshed in the lobby? Mark Brooks. What are you going to do? Keep it to yourself? No. You're going to tell him all about it. Him and his stupid Hugh Hefner rope. <laughs> so it became like drama con. Which was kind of a beautiful thing in a fucked up way as well. <laughs> I gotta be filming that stuff. I mean, that's that's a reality TV show. Just yeah. you know, all these does the work people are doing to make these Netflix pitches for their comics. I mean, just go down there, yeah. have cameras everywhere, film one of the conventions, slice it up into eight episodes. You've got yourself a, a you've got yourself an yeah. instant show. I you know. I know. I heard about a handful of reality comic book shows that were kind of spinning around for a bit. There was like a wannabe. Mm-hmm. Um, you must have heard about these too, right? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, there's been a few and the pilots and and ones that actually made it, but they were all terrible. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Someone pitched me a few. There was two people in Manhattan that had ideas, and they assured me it was going to get off the ground. And I'm like, yeah, just give me a call when you get a green light. I never heard from them again. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, no, never works out. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if you had those cameras, everybody overthinks it. You just put the cameras in the con, you put the cameras up in the Hyatt bar, you, yeah. you know, open a window a little bit and you just let you, you film it and wait to see what happens. And <laughs> it's like, Oh, Donny Cates is going out the window and then, you know, you, you catch him of course, but yeah. there you go. That's your cliffhanger. Well, I would have caught him, but I didn't know it was him because I couldn't that's, see his fucking blonde hair. That's true. <laughs> You're like, like, oh, that's, just a, that's just a waiter. We let him die. You know, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> If you had to invest in a publisher right now, oh God. which publisher do you think is making the best moves, all things considered? Um, wow. Uh, I think, Jesus, uh, that, that's, it's been a rougher answer over the last six months. Uh, yeah. Because I think, you know, a year ago, I think Boom would have been a, probably a pretty solid answer. Um, I think AWA, even though they had the hiccup with the, uh, you know, making a comic about a pandemic right before a pandemic, uh, <laughs> just an awkward move. I, I yeah. mean, it's it, God, it's a lot harder now because it's the, the business is fragmented. A lot of people are in defensive spending mode right now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of good ideas out there. I actually, you know, publisher making the best moves right now, Viz, probably Viz by a, a oh, okay. Cool. You know, that's a cheap I, answer though. You know what that's I want? A cheap answer. Yeah. I'm looking for Dark Horse, Boom, IDW, Marvel, DC, Image. Well, it's it's it's. Uh, let's see. We'll 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 take the big two off the table for the moment. Um, okay. That's fair. I mean, Image. You know, they're they're uh, again they're they're putting out too many books. I mean, they're they're putting out a mass strategy right now, which I think is starting to fold in on itself. I mean, I, I was uh, visiting a friend at a comic shop a couple of days ago. And just these massive stacks of these image books by big creators, by, uh, hmm. you know, by James and by Scott and by kind of the, you know, Al Ewing and these others. And they just have huge stacks on the shelves. And, and the answer was, there's too many of them. They're just, it's just, yeah. it's, it's like the image in the early nineties. We can't keep up. Yeah. Um, Boom has gone a little quiet. I think uh, they're probably making some good licensing deals right now. So that's, mm-hmm. that's probably still a decent pick. IDW is, uh, terrifying to me I, I i would love to see them kind of dip out and, and go back up but uh that's, yeah. that's a scary place to be right now i i i lost two editors to idw uh so I, right. I can't say yeah. too much but i i was shocked that um given that idw lost money on these two netflix uh, three netflix deals yeah uh i don't know what kind of angel investor they have that's, that's <laughs> and i know that mark and maggie want to make um IDW, the place where creators go to bring their new IPs. I, I get that would be super nice, of course, but I don't know how they're going to get there. And I, I don't know if when they came up with this plan, if they knew that IDW was going to be ditching Diamond or all the other bad news that's happened since then. Like, I don't know how real, realistic that plan is. I mean, if they could pull it off and and yeah. Mark is is great, Maggie is great, so I hope they yes. can. And if that's yeah. what they're doing, then um, I, you know, they'll rock it as crazy as it sounds. They'll rock it 
up the list. Um, yeah. they and I would happily that. join that team as a, as a loyal you know friend of theirs. I would absolutely partake in that, assuming mm-hmm. I can see that there's some something there. Go yeah. ahead. I no, I hope I hope they I hope they can. Um, I think that Image has got themselves in a little bit of a corner. I think again, Boom is is definitely pursuing a licensing strategy right now, and that that probably is where they need to be. I guess uh, Dark Horse is is kind of is who they are. Um, I know that there was a lot a lot of rumors that they were going to get bought uh, about a mm-hmm. year and a half ago, like really good rumors. But they uh, you know they're they're still around, obviously. I mean, if if IDW could pull something like that off, I think it would be great. Uh, yeah. I guess, I don't know how realistic that is right now. Yeah. You know, the funny thing of a lot of this, these people is people who work in these offices, they get sucked in by the cultural environment mm-hmm. and they don't, they don't, they can't even admit when their own bosses are possibly missing something or yeah. doing something wrong. Like they can't see the forest through the trees. And I think a lot of the people I worked with are very smart, but I, I had a marketing person tell me why Tom King's, Batman Catwoman marriage fake out was a good idea. Mm-hmm. And for an hour, she went on telling me how there's no such thing as bad press. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I'm sorry. I, you, Tom's career might not ever be the same. You pissed off a lot of stores. Like I, I, I get that you want to put a positive spin on this, but like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> you know? No, I, I agree. I, I mean, that that's an old kind of myth. This idea that that yeah. you know, there's no bad marketing. I mean, you look at. You know, and I'm not to go too deep into it. We look at a guy like Tom King. I think he was positioned certainly before yeah. that that wedding issue yeah. to he he would have been the Scott Snyder. He would have been taking that extra whatever the the steps exactly mm-hmm. mean. He would have been yeah. up a step, yeah. and instead he's doing these um, you know these limited series kind of titles, and it's still good for him. I'm sure he's financially very happy and everything else. But he yeah. was at that point where it's like you know be in that place with Snyder and Bendis and some of the other big names that could kind of write their own longer term ticket. Yeah. And this other thing, again, no tears. I'm sure he's making lots of money and he's fine, but yeah, that, that moment didn't help. Um, yeah. yeah. My, my, my litmus test for people uh, in the office when I meet them is what do you think DC is missing right now? What do you think they're doing wrong? And most of the time they can't answer, which is shocking because when you run a company, you have to assume you're always missing something. You yeah, have to assume they're always getting something wrong. Like it's not even criticizing the hand that, you know, biting the hand that feeds you. It's just basically like if you think that your company is doing everything right as this industry goes through shifts, you're probably missing stuff because there's guaranteed to be stuff they're fucking up, and it's human to fuck up. It's okay, just admit it. But a lot of these people cannot honestly think of anything wrong that their publisher, that their paycheck is giving, you know, is doing anything wrong. And that's to me what's scary is they're drinking so much of the Kool Aid yep. that they're not seeing it. No, I mean, risk analysis is a real thing. It's a, it's a job that yeah. you know, major corporations actually focus on. It's, it's the, what are we missing? What's going wrong? What's going to yeah. ink us? And the, you know, Apple, Steve Jobs notoriously would be up at night worrying about what he was missing while his company was dominating. And yeah. I think that any, any group that's sitting there and, and you're right. I, I mean, I hear this a lot from comics, like we're doing everything perfectly. I, I've heard many editors say this and it's yeah. like, I'm buying all your drinks because you can't afford them. Not everything yeah. is great. Clearly not everything is great. Yeah. It, it, it's like they think the industry is 10 they, they they think it still runs the same way it did 15 years ago. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because they're being fed that lie from the inside. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Digital, we'll, we'll figure digital out eventually. Yeah, manga comes and goes. Whatever. Comics are healthy. Mm-hmm. Dogman sold a lot. What are you worried about? Mm-hmm. It's like you don't understand how much of a threat um, Substack, digital, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, you don't understand how it's changing out there. You've been in the office for too long. You're missing it. And you're not dumb. You're just being fed <laughs> one narrative. Well, yeah. And, and the business has punished people who break the narrative. That's the other problem is, is if you do go yeah. and go, well, maybe everything's not perfect. Maybe we should worry right. about some of this stuff it's like well or, you're not yeah. turning evil on us are you i mean it's it, right. it it teaches people to go along with the story and just be very benign about it and right it's uh that's, no, it's a major that, problem that's what's so interesting about nick spencer and tinian changing course is they're not act outwardly criticizing anything but their actions are a threat but because they're nice guys and aren't posting bullshit on twitter or whatever like you can't really get that mad at them but their their actions are a massive criticism of what's going on right now, and it's like, 
yeah, I don't know. It's good to see them doing that because I like a disruptor as much as you do. I, I the industry is healthier with disruption. It needs to yeah. people need to get in there and need to try different things. So I'm glad they are. And and when people try new things, as the other lesson the comic industry needs to learn is yeah. some of those things are going to fail miserably. And that's yeah. an, that's a good thing. It's good to right. learn. You know, don't be scared. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's imagine you've had like six drinks and you're really drunk and I need you to answer this question very quickly. Which publisher would you like to disappear completely? <laughs> oh, I mean, probably, you know, probably Marvel, honestly. Oh, uh, okay. Wow, this is, you went right with the drinks. Top. There you go. <laughs> so obviously that would be catastrophic to the business. It would be painful to a bunch of friends, very close friends of mine, everything else. And I love those characters, a lot of them and the legacies and everything <laughs> else. Um, that said, uh, that, you know, what a lot of people don't talk about is that like for 30 years or so, Marvel has had the rep of being the arrogant publisher. It's hmm. that's just kind of their, that they've, and they've carried it with it as they've had changes in, you know, in, in the editor in chief and, and the other people, they've, they've always had this reputation of being kind of the one that was annoying to work with the one that mm -hmm. looked down on other people. And there's been a comeuppance that's been needed for a long time for that company. So, uh, you know, so I, again, I asked uh, you, you, I asked, I answered you quickly. Like I'd had a lot of drinks. Um, I love it. No, thank yeah, you. You do what I asked. Thank you. But I would hate it. I mean, I, I mean, what I would hope is that it, would fold and then Disney would be like, all right, well, we guess we got to farm off these properties to somebody else and who's going to step up and kind of take yeah. it from here. And then that would be the rebirth of, you know, a better company. So, yeah, <laughs> I pissed so many people off that answer. Yeah. I thought I, you were going to say like avatar or a uh, tidal wave or one of these companies publishers that burns people constantly <laughs> well i mean yeah i mean well for sure i mean the, the funny thing is those people are gonna you know burn themselves i mean i yeah I, it's in many cases i just step out of the way and they'll take care of it on their own but right um definitely there are dodgy small publishers that deserve it but yeah um, i i don't know swing for the fences on that what are your favorite topics to discuss with fans readers customers and pros you know, I, I think kind of the how ideas were made. I, I think when we talk about comics and, and some of these big storylines, people will say things like, oh, do you remember this storyline or do you remember this moment? And this was a cool moment, wasn't it? And the thing I like to always talk about is like, what what were the five things that led you to this? Like when I'm mm -hmm. talking to, to Claremont, it's like, why? what what was the what's the backstory to getting to when you did the, the, the you know Dark Phoenix saga? What, what was... What was going on? And in many cases, the answer, which I like, is yeah. business. It's it's cold and cow. It's like, well, we needed something to fill a number in the you know late summer of yeah. seventy eight. And it's like that. That's an interesting answer. Uh, it's it's yeah. like the death of Superman came about because there was this Lois and Clark show, and they wanted to do something <laughs> to kind of attach itself to that. And I'm just yeah. fascinated by that stuff. Yeah, it's funny the um the behind the scenes answers can seem dull to a lot of people but if you know what you're talking about i think they become very fascinating and if you have a good uh, understanding of business and branding and marketing you could talk to claremont like him talking about the decision to do you know this phoenix saga you want to hear something really deep and inspirational you know that gives you something to take with you for the rest of your life when you hear that it's just a numbers game and it was a last minute decision but he still made it really good like mm -hmm. i don't think that's upsetting at all like i think that's just as good but i know that's not what people want to hear from him you know oh for sure and but that's that is the kind of stuff i i i just i love hearing that part of the story i love it where you can see something that is full-on art yeah. and it comes out of a very cold calculated business decision and so how did you go from this this silly technical mandate to you know craven's last hunt how did mm -hmm. you how did you get there and, and that kind of stuff i love having those conversations and i find that at least the creators I talk to like having those conversations too. It's mm -hmm. they don't usually get asked those questions. They they get asked like, yeah, you know, what do you think of Craven? He's got a you know animal skin <laughs> on him. Is he vegan? It's like oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Now, uh, what topics do you try to avoid at conventions? Uh, anything to do with kind of online fan silliness or customer. Silly. I mean, any of that. Um, yeah. And it's it's because it's it's so. Uh, it's just so baited. Uh, so there's so much that is buried in there. Uh, you can't yeah. have a good conversation. And, and I mean, uh, it, with some exceptions, I think yourself, uh, Jeff Thorne, I think, uh, you know, I, I've been able to have some really good conversations about kind of the nuance of it. 
Yeah. But a lot of cases it's, it's, uh, you know, and I, there's one creator in general, a writer who always wants to talk about, it's like, Hey, how about those, uh, terrible fans who bullied Heather Antos? And it's like, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know what to say to that conversation. You know, yeah. it's been said 8,000 times already. It's yeah. you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. No, my, I, I wish I wasn't like this, but my favorite, well, my go-to, um, topic of conversation with most people these days is why is the left losing its mind? And I say that as part of the club. Like I, I, I care about liberal issues, but when I see my radical liberal friends, like I, I can't help but con- and there's never there's a never ending plethora of ex- news stories, dumb things, and things that abandon readers. And it just I it I never get tired of it. And I, I wish I wasn't like this, but I I'd rather talk about that than comics, honestly. And I I wish I wasn't like that. I just cannot wrap my head around it. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, me too. I, I it is tough. I, so, like you said, I mean, I'm and people have speculated all over the place. I mean, I, I have to answer now. I'm I, I hate all the I hate all the politics. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, and it start raining like crazy here. Uh, anyway, yeah. uh, hopefully that's not too distracting. Um, nope, nope, you're good. The, the uh, you know, I, I I I definitely would say at one time I was yeah. more left. I think, but yeah. when you grew up in Colorado, left wing meant something dramatically different than being left wing yeah. in Seattle. And yeah. nobody in the Seattle area would probably classify me as left wing anymore. Yeah. Um, and I, I just I hate that it's gone that direction. There is no, I mean, yeah. left wing used to be the anti censorship club. That was one reason I liked it. Yeah, no, now the left wing are the Puritans. They're clutching pearls and painting couches and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I don't get it. Um, I don't get why that's changed, when that's changed. Well, I mean, you know, it, yeah. there's, that's a whole other topic, but it's yeah. a great one to talk over with people. I just can't, you know, you're, you're in the club. I, I think me coming from the outside trying to have that conversation would never work. Yeah, I mean, all my friends in comics are devout liberals. They're convinced AOC is going to be the next president. Um mm. It, yeah, and I'm the only one that pushes back. And again, like I, I am a liberal too, but I'm like a seven out of ten, and they're all ten out of ten. And I just get hammered for daring to question AOC or pointing out dumb things she says. Uh, and I, oh man, it's it's pretty thankless being in the middle, <laughs> being on the oh, fence, yeah. right? <laughs> it definitely is, but it's it's the only way you can operate. I mean, that's the the funny part about it is I think the the hardcore ideologues they don't get anything done. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's God, what a, what a terrible time. This is yeah. again, why I, I, I should be in New York with you and having a drink. That's yeah. Yeah. No, so, um, I, uh, a year ago, I, when the, uh, blue, uh, protests were happening, mm-hmm. I go on Twitter it was right before I quit. And, uh, I, I see everybody saying, all cops are racist. All cops are bad. All cops, this, that, uh, and I have friends that are cops. I have readers that are cops and I know that all cops are not bad and racist. I know a lot of black cops that clearly aren't racist. Um, and I made a tweet that was like, I don't think people should, if you want to protest, don't be breaking into buildings. That just makes you look bad. Like, I think you can be pro blue lives and also pro protest at the same time. Uh, but that is not something that Twitter was ready to hear. And that was kind of like the beginning of the end for me anyway. Yeah. I, I it, it was weird to me. I mean, I, I not to get completely on a tangent, but it was weird to me in a time when, you know, there was so much concern about public gathering that that yeah. just got dropped. And that, that's yeah. the thing that always bugs me is, is inconsistency more than anything else. Like I, I it's yeah. fine disagreeing with somebody. I, I have lots of people that view different things, but when it's inconsistent, it's just, it's like the brain starts to shut down. I can't yeah, make yeah. sure realize what's going on. Yeah, no, the people who they seem to be advocating for a world that has zero police officers. Like, are you fucking crazy? You wouldn't want to live there. Like, what what version of Sim City are you playing where you don't have a police department? Like, what the fuck is? And you are playing into Republican hands, by the way. If you oh, really I'm, want to game it out here, what the hell are you 100%. saying? <laughs> I, there's always a part that is like you have to have some game theory and some strategy. Like, it, it, it's and again, I can do strategy for things I. I hate because I mean, if you're yeah. going to run a business, you could, you'd have to think that way. But like right now that the strategy of, of get rid of all the police is handing Republicans elections. So if you're, yeah. if you're a Democrat, you should hate that strategy. Yes. But yeah. you know, whatever, whatever you want to do. I mean, you're, if you want to advocate for the purge, you know, you can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, if you, um, 
go back back to these uh, to, to me interviewing you. Is there a All character right. uh, that you would want to write or draw or be involved with? You could do it your way. If you could like white knight it in a way, uh, you know, I'd love, to, whatever. I, I, it, I'd love to take a crack at the fantastic four sometime because I do think the family dynamic is, is really underutilized. Yeah. And I say that for the, like, you know, you have Pixar come in and do the Incredibles and do a far better <laughs> job than Marvel. So I think if I'm Marvel, like, I should be like, all right, I am not going to put up with this shit anymore. I, I've got to go down and reclaim. Um, yeah kind of what got me to the table. So I, I always, I, you know, I, I do a lot of things on dares. I, I think that would be pretty good. I'd love to do a Legion of superheroes book for sure. Um, that Legion, would yeah. It's funny. The cult that that, that has, it is a cult. Yeah. 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 What is yeah. it about that story that, that landed with people? Do you think? Uh, I mean, for me, it was potential. It was just like, Hey, here's a, a world that's a, in a bit of a sandbox, lots of different powers, lots of different environments. We can do whatever yeah. we want with it. And, um, you know, just, just, you know, no limits. And I think that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, it's also one of those kind of like fantastic four where it's lived down to its potential um, quite a lot lately. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I hate that. I hate that people aren't doing more with it. I think that, you know, I, yeah. I always, I always think that that's, that's very, there's a lot more that, that could be done that isn't being done. And so I, I'd love to take a crack at both of those, but yeah. I do say, you know, with all, and this is going to be the fluffing part of the conversation. I've loved what you've done with White Knight. I just, I love that you carved out this universe. You took it over there. You, you <laughs> put some realism to it. You did it in a way that fits your style. Like, I, I wish more people would do that um, rather than no, try and you. Kind of really merge it. So you did great. Yeah. No, I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Um, it's funny. I got into a de debate with a, a famous uh, artist because he won an Eisner. And and I was telling him I don't care about Eisners, and he got upset. Um, <laughs> for disclosure, I've I've won two Eisners. I did not go to the ceremony, and I don't think I'll ever get <laughs> nominated ever again because I just Aww. don't care. Um, but uh, <sighs> fuck, I just lost my train of thought. This is when you can tell the vodka is hitting. <laughs> Perfect. No, I, I it, the funny thing about the Eisners is like I have a ton of respect for Will Eisner. I mean, I, yeah. I think the. I, I wish the awards actually had more to do with him somehow than <laughs> what they yeah. are. Yeah. Like the, um, the woman, it's funny. Cause like I, people don't seem to know how the Eisners work. They just, because it's the biggest ceremony in comics, we just assume that it's, you know, run really well and run logically. And, you know, you like to think there's no politics, but of course there are. And I know that there have been books that have been nominated because they were quote unquote woke. Uh, even though the woman that runs the Eisners is very Republican. Yeah. That's um, right. And people don't realize like they don't, they, they read and they pick from what's been submitted. If your editor didn't submit your book, you won't get nominated for an Eisner unless a judge really goes out of their way to advocate for your book. And they have to read like, I don't know, a ton of books in a weekend or something like that and decide, you know more about it than I do perch. No, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's very, it's clunky. It's a not even close to representative what's actually going on. And then people don't yeah. read everything. I mean, they, you get kind of this segmented group of the titles that you're supposed to read. And yeah, I mean, it's a great experience for people who just want to go off and, and read some comics, but I mean, I, I don't think it's, it, it's, it's very loosely run. And as a result, it, I don't know yeah. how meaningful it yeah. is. Like, is there a people's choice awards for comics? No, I, I, we lost all that stuff. I mean, yeah. I think Wizard used to kind of try and do little things like that, but really, yeah. I mean, that this opens up a whole other topic. But it's, it's why the kind of news media or the the comic news media is so such garbage. I mean, it's like there's basic yeah. things that we should have like that. <laughs> That's definitely a direction I'm happy to go right now. Let me add my own bit to that. Is yep. there's not a lot of capital in comics, therefore there's not a lot of money to pay people that are decent reporters. If you're a reporter in comics, you're probably doing it for free or because you love it, which is beautiful. However, are you really in an impartial, unbiased, you know, opinion on these things? Are you trying to subscribe to the classic, you know, uh, journalism code, you know, feed and fair of information, you know, rain, sleet or snow, whatever the hell it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't actually think that there's a coda for, uh, for reporters. But yeah, when people love to make fun of the comic book media, it's like all the really good reporters are busy working for real media stations, but there's no money in comics. So we get stuck with like fanboys and fangirls who sort of just fill the place and fill the void rather. 
Absolutely. And and so much of the business is built on, can I get some free comics to look at? And so yeah. as soon as you're doing something for free, like, what do you think that review is going to be? You know, you're not going to want to turn off that gravy train. So, yeah. you know, I, and, and it's, I, I mean, it's just, just goofy. I mean, I, I was looking at uh, a story today where, you know, this reporter was like posting photos of somebody's car he didn't like with a license plate showing and like that mm-hmm. just just dodgy shit yeah man. yeah you know um there's a big writer that i've worked with uh it's not scott uh <laughs> this writer lives in the uk and a reporter from bleeding oh. cool took photos of his house and yeah. he reported it to scotland yard and there's currently like a uh cease and desist or whatever uh you would call right. it over there uh you can't come within 100 feet or whatever uh, against Rich Johnson or anyone who's working for Rich Johnson, basically. And uh, he has been booted out of panel discussions and security is like, it's pretty nasty what Bleeding Cool will do for the story. And I, this isn't the place to do it, but I would love to, to hear you do a podcast about why Bleeding Cool is actually really bad for comics. <laughs> <laughs> I think also, I also for safety like all the videos yeah no i, yeah. I it, it's funny it's like oh, i wonder who you could be talking about um yeah i <laughs> i uh no I, I i hate it i hate it so much um i absolutely hate that kind of stuff i mean that's obviously not journalism and uh it's yeah. you know but it but it is indicative of there's not a lot of money in comics and the people yep. who are in this news media are doing it for i mean in, in many cases it's so i can get free comics so i can meet people at shows and I, yeah. I'm, I'm part of the business and it's, you know, there, there's no ethics in any of this. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, I mean, I think anyone with any common sense can hear that story and, and things like it. And there's been other stories like that and go, well, that's clearly yeah. terribly wrong and terrible and yeah. nobody should be putting up with that. And right. And yeah. we, need, we deserve better in comics for that. <laughs> you no, know, I, uh, one party, I met a girl who worked at comic Alliance and she was hitting on me pretty hard and I got uncomfortable and I'm like, listen, I'm married, blah, blah, blah. And she wouldn't let up. And she seemed to give me this impression that she literally told me that she's hooked up with X, Y, Z creators. And this was what mm. she did. And she's supposed to be an unbiased reporter. You know, and Comic Alliance was known for being very woke and, and all that stuff, which I I think mm-hmm. is a good thing. But she was not doing that. Uh, and then another it happens to be female reporter would get sloshed uh at shows and her husband would start begging for work from me and scott snyder and it's just like wow this these you guys are like the best we have huh yeah awesome <laughs> like this sucks we don't have better reporters in this industry <laughs> it it it's so um yeah i mean it, it's, it's but it's it's all about and i i've gotten beaten up a lot uh, over the last couple months of saying we need more money in comics, we should be, get paid more and everything else. And I get yep. why people are adverse to hearing that because they're like, well, I don't want the person I dislike to get paid more. So like, I, I, I totally understand. But if there's more money at play, th- these kinds of things won't go on as much. Uh, so yep. They still will, but less. I mean, you do not hear about like the executive at Google, you know, trying to give a hand job to the executive at Microsoft at a convention because they're both sloshed. I mean, yeah. they, they do that in private. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it should be done <laughs> yes Man. it's you, it's such a messy thing yeah you're a you're a married guy with two kids i'm yeah. married i have no kids but can you imagine being a creator at shows and dating from your line can you imagine like what if you're with some girl who's gonna take a video of you in the morning while you're still passed out like i feel like you could be canceled at any moment for philandering with customers like how the hell is there any kind of like sexual dating uh going on in comics it just seems like a, a bunch of landmines it it is and i know there's a lot of photos and videos out there um yeah i mean i, I know there's some photos out there because I, I i've seen some photos <laughs> i have too yep. <laughs> i know they're out there and i think they'll come out at some point it will suck uh but i mean yeah i i god what a what a terrible bottom feeder part of this industry i mean they're, that's the worst aspect of it for sure yeah but i i know because i've been to car shows and boat shows uh, other conventions like I know that anytime a bunch of adults get on a plane go three time zones get sloshed and you're hanging out like I get adults are adults you're consenting you're going to have hookups you're going to have that culture I get it but in comics it's so public and so obvious and so like we wear our sins on our sleeve mm-hmm. whereas I feel like in Hollywood this shit happens too but the difference is there's money in Hollywood yep. and they have money to bury this stuff and they have handlers to deal with it <laughs> and we don't have that in comics 
No, I, I absolutely. I think that there's because there's money. Be, there's it's treated more carefully. I think people do take one extra bit of caution because they're they understand there's more at stake. Um, yeah. Stuff still happens, of course, and and but it uh, with comics, it's it's almost a sense of pride. I think people have that they are just out there with all this stuff, and yeah, you know, and I, I on one level, kind of back to the very beginning with with Rollins, I appreciate the purity of that. I like that. Yeah. You know, it is more raw and you can see it happening. But on the other hand, it's it's hard to watch people make mistakes, like really dumb rookie mistakes over yeah. and over, over again. Yeah, your unforced error th- uh, phrase is, is worth, I think about that a lot. Um, yeah. I also think about the phrase leveling up. And yeah. I, I'd like to do a whole other podcast with you on that. Because I think that's such a, a convenient phrase on how to level up. And, you know, you can people who are looking for likes feel like they're leveling up, but they're not. And I feel like using the phrase leveling up more and more might actually help creators get out of this maw, assuming they're even mm-hmm. listening. I wish this, so I'd love to talk to you about that. I think, uh, yeah. you know what, maybe one of the problems we have here is that there's not really a career path for creators. Yeah. It's, it's you do your job and then maybe get another job. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, where's, where's the promotion path? Where are you like, where, right. where are the stakes? Now, were comics in the 50s and 60s seen as a side gig for a lot of illustrators? I don't think so. I mean, I, I think it, it was for some extent, but I think it, it was more of a, you know, you were in a business. Here's a funny thing. I, you talk to some of the older creators and you look at some of the older things that were written. And, yeah. you know, it was like they're very cognizant of the fact that they were putting out books or selling a million to two million copies. Mm-hmm. And they, they knew it and they were aware of kind of where it was going. And you can even take kind of an artist who, uh, you know, would, would say, I don't know much about the business, but they would be able to rattle off the different territories where the book is selling better. Right. And that's, that was a major change that we lost yeah. all that transparency. And I think it helped. Yeah. I heard recently that um, illustrators in the sixties thought of this as a side gig. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the big names of course were doing multiple books. So that was their main job you know kirby clearly was most you know this was his main source of income but a lot of artists dipped in and out and they saw it as a side gig and it wasn't until you know the 70s and 80s and 90s when there was enough money where a creator could make it an artist could just be based in comics and then something's changing now where there's just not enough money to do this as a full-time job anymore but I don't know if that's true. Is that everything I just said? Does that not line up or what? It, it, it may. I, I think there's probably a little both. I, I mean, I'm sure there are some people in the sixties who had other jobs and other things, but it, I guess the difference is it wasn't considered like I've got a core job and then comics is my you know side hustle that I kind of do it in the evenings. It was more like right. I work two jobs and this is one of those two jobs. It was right. maybe slightly different. I, I, I do worry today we're heading into this comics is the, is the thing we do in the night or it's the thing we do if we want to be really, really poor. And I, those are yeah. terrible options. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I am, I don't know if I am scared for the industry or if I'm happy to let it go through growing pains because it's about time. And, but yeah. my, my perspective is like, I've sort of conquered my mountain. I can go to Kickstarter and make a good living, but I don't, I've sort of gone over the, the, the worst speed bumps there are. So I'm going to be fine no matter what, cause I made a name for myself. But a lot of my younger friends who are still trying to make it, you know, they're very scared because they don't know what this is going to look like. Um, and I don't blame them for, for being nervous. Of course, you know? Yeah. I, I think it, I think it's going to be a terrifying time for a lot of people. I think it is necessary, which is no comfort to people who are going to get, you know, hurt in this process, but I, I yeah. do think the next 18 months are going to be really, really rough. And yeah. I, I, the biggest part of it is I think that a lot of things people have believed for 30 years are going to crumble. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's going to be just terrible for people uh, yeah. who, you know, are going to find the world turns upside down. I think the difference between this particular transition that we've, from what we've had in the past is that in the past, um, uh, people weren't so incredibly rigid in believing what they believe they, they yeah. were ready. They, they at least accepted some level of change now. Right. I mean, I I've talked to creators who are off by how things are selling, yeah. not by a little bit, but by, you know, <laughs> by an extra digit or two, um, yeah. you know, something is like, I, I believe that it's, you know, this is seven figures. It's like, mm-hmm. no, it's five. And that's, that's a huge difference of, yeah. Um, yeah. 
No, I mean, the amount of creators who don't even know what their numbers are, don't even ask for their numbers. I think 80% of creators don't have any interest or don't have access to the data of what their book is selling. And even if they have the number, they don't know where it lines up, like uh, as far as, you know, top 10, top 20, top 100. And it's like, this is your job. Why are you asking these questions? It's just startling to me. Like I, sometimes in my my worst moments, I think these idiots deserve to get fucked because they're not paying attention. You know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Henry Rollins in you. I, I, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's 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 hard. Uh, the, the hardest part is when you're like, "Hey, I'm coming with help. Hey, I'm coming with advice. Hey, I'm coming with a suggestion. Hey, I'm coming with a deal," and you get you know people pushing back consistent like i don't need your help i don't need your help here and then yeah. when things start to burn down it's like well okay i guess uh yeah good luck you know yeah. <laughs> i i use that glass of water after you earlier hopefully that will help put out yeah. the flames but you know and it, it is in in my worst moments i there's been people certainly that i've offered help which is you know uh, for free just because i i don't want to see them suffer and and then things go bad and and mm-hmm. Well, all right, you're on your own. Yeah. So, yep. It's tough, but um, but overall, I, you. I mean, we both love comics, so you know, I, I think we'll be okay. I think a lot of people will be okay. It's just yeah. this is going to be a this is going to be a purge. <laughs> yeah. If you like it, you'll figure it out. If you're dedicated, you'll figure it out. Like it's it's the basic market. It's the capitalism. And it, you know, all the politics and the the culture war shit aside. The rules are still the same. If you're good at this, you can produce and you're respectful and consistent or whatever, then you should be able to find your footing, you know? Yeah, I, I think. And the funny thing is comics has a bit of uh, evergreen quality to it. People want entertainment. I understand the whole like, oh, people won't read books anymore, but that's that's proving not to be true. I mean, we, we do see yeah. Scholastic and manga doing just fine. Um it, yep. it is, it's always there. People like to be entertained. So this should be a very bulletproof industry. If yeah. not stupid. So a few more, uh, we'll go to a few lighter questions before we finish up here. Oh, awesome. Uh, but I appreciate you getting into the darker stuff with me. Cause I could do this all <laughs> night. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to, this is fun. Yeah. This is like, we should just do this, like have a monthly checkpoint. I, I still, it's super weird. Everybody would rather hear from you than me, but it's still a fun conversation. No, but I think this is a good back and forth going on here. Um, all right, so let's get some fun stuff here. What's your favorite comic book movie from the '90s? Oh, from the '90s, shit! See, yeah. I had my Superman three. I know. All that's ready to that's go. why I went around that. Damn it! Um, <laughs> you know, I, I like Blade like everybody else. Um, I'm sure. God, I'm, I'm forgetting something. I'm forgetting something major. In the '90s, didn't? Um, God, when did so we get? Uh, we got Ninja Turtles. We got Rocketeer, Shadow, oh, Batman. Good. Yeah. Um, Blades, of course. Yeah, the Blades. Rocketeer was a solid film. I, I think that holds up. It's it's yeah. fine. Um, what were you I, gonna say? I, I, no, I'm trying. To, it's, oh, it's always Superman. <laughs> yeah, um, that's that's my guilty pleasure. I, I, what can <laughs> I say? Uh, one of my best friends, uh, Mystery Men. That was a solid. I don't know if that counts, but that was fun. That counts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Crow is good for that goth phase. That, uh, oh my God, I love I love the Crow. I'm. Yeah, I'm emba- I'm slightly embarrassed, but I'm not. I f- fuck it. It has Henry Rollins on the soundtrack. Yes. What do you want? <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm a sucker for low budget movies that find creative ways to push through. You know. Yeah, I. I uh, if you're going more for the kid based, I think Iron Giant. If you consider that a superhero movie, I think that. That would be yeah, that is probably one of the best superhero movies. Period. <laughs> yeah. uh, what about your favorite Marvel universe type movie? Uh, let's see. What's the one I enjoyed the most? Um, yeah, you know, for what it was, I thought the first Ant Man was fun. Um, mm-hmm. If we're talking about this new cinematic kind of universe area, I mean, uh, let's go from uh, first X Men because I think that the Marvel yeah. thing kind of started with X Men One up to yeah. today. Yeah, first X Men was was a fun film. I mean, it 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 does not hold up, but it was. Uh, I enjoyed that <laughs> time. Um, <coughs> God, if we want to go back to that, like those terrible, like Corbin, Captain America, and the Fantastic Four from the seventies and eighties. I mean, no, no, no. <laughs> um, if I asked you like your favorite ironic superhero movie, then that would be a good answer. But like you know, Marvel Universe stuff, like the standard, you know, from uh, Iron Man till now. What's your favorite Marvel movie? So Ant Man, you said you liked. Yeah, I did like Ant Man. I, I thought that was fun. I thought I thought what Gunn did with uh, Guardians was solid um, for yeah. sure. 
Um, I, I think there's, there's, I think there's been a few, um, I mean, the, the funny thing about the Marvel movies, oh, well, I'll put it this way. I thought the payoff for, uh, you know, in-game and Infinity War was solid. I mean, it, they built on everything and it, it had the, you know, some moments and it was very manipulative for sure. And it won't yeah. hold up either, but it was nice to see that giant spectacle come to life. Yeah. It's the closest thing we've gotten to seeing like a Secret Wars type everything. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. no, uh, I'm sort of, I kind of want to fast forward 10 years from now where we have this documentary about the Marvel Universe in Hollywood and how that happened, what happened. Like, yeah. give me the movies that made us kind of quick documentary about it. Um, even if you can nitpick some of the movies, the fact is that they did something completely unprecedented. They, they took nerdy comics, which people thought were for kids. They used you know modern cgi and all this stuff they wove this intricate fabric you know um they had a few misses along the way but most of marvel's products was at least a b minus or above mm -hmm. and they, they did even if you didn't love endgame they managed to fit like 50 fucking characters in there and yeah. each give them each a moment and not have the film feel that crowded like whether it ever wins an oscar or whatever you can say whatever you want against it like that is a giant accomplishment that no one has ever accomplished and you can't take that away from them Absolutely. No, absolutely. And it's funny because it, it did, it gave people space. It's funny watching this film. Uh, my daughters are watching Infinity War and it's like, I'm looking at this going, oh man, the scene, like where are all the other heroes? Like they, they didn't. And, and it's just funny. My brain now with, with the extra shows that they've done and the other characters yeah. that they're bringing in and everything else, suddenly it seems small. And it's just, it's weird to me. Like the, yeah. as a kid, if I thought I would get to see that level of spectacle on a screen, I, there's, I never would have imagined. So I, they, they deserve it. Yeah. I think that's been a wild ride with those guys. I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. I was doing some work with Disney during some of this. Um, and that was an interesting way to see how that was absorbed by that company. But yeah, yeah, that's a whole other video too. <laughs> yeah. My wife worked for Disney too. She was, uh, mm -hmm. helped re, uh, she helped create the digital, uh, photography program that you get in the parks. That's right. Um, you guys have, I mean, when we all get together, you'll have some stuff to talk about. I we, love we the, have a, we have a little crossover there. That's right. Like the NDAs you have to sign for yeah. like, uh, all the pedophiles they hire to work inside the costumes, creatures and how there's like, <laughs> uh, I think goofy got ran over by a float one year and they had to, yep. they weren't, they wouldn't take his mask off to let him to breathe because it would have shattered the illusion to these children. <laughs> <laughs> it's always funny the uh like in a really hot summer the full character costumes they've got yeah. ice in there and so they're their characters walking around <laughs> and they're leaving these wet footprints and it's <laughs> what's going on in there it's, i uh, just thought that was semen yeah that's, that's <laughs> 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 this is this is how city of bruce happens right like that. oh my god no I'll, I'll let my wife tell the full story of it she was actually at disney once uh and the guy who played the genie cornered her and in, in, pulled her into a closet with the okay. big fucking scary blue genie head on. And he said some stuff to her that wasn't cool. And it was like, that's when she realized a lot of these people they hire for these roles. It's like they're fresh out of jail or something. There's something weird going on with these character actors. Yeah, I, I think, well, yeah, I think there's a lot of, a lot of things <laughs> over there, I, I, you know, from the heat to the working conditions to the type of person who, you know, yep. would be okay with wearing a costume all year. I mean, I think a lot of things come into play there. That's true. Yeah. Did you ever sign an NDA with Disney? Like, are you contractually not allowed to say certain things right now? I have many NDAs with Disney, yes. Uh, okay, good to know. Yeah. Damn it. I really want you to open up. Let's, we'll have a good dinner. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Oh, that's all I can think of for now. That's fine. Well, let's do this again. Questions next time. Let's do this again quickly. Uh, I, I mean, this is a lot of fun. I, I love, I mean, again, I, I apologize to anyone who had to be bored listening to, to me, but yeah, this is fun. I love, I love our conversations. No, I love it, man. I think we're, we're getting to the root of some stuff here. And uh, I think it's like, it's like you're like a, a therapist to me. Like I said that many times in the past, like I need to know that there's someone else in the industry that isn't losing their mind that has a steady hand on the wheel, so to speak, you know, uh, dude, I feel the same way. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm investing my money into running opening shops, running shops, and all the rest. Like I, I feel better knowing that the, the product producer is not maniac. So <laughs> when, when is your shop going to open? Cause I want to do a signing. Uh, I, well, we'll definitely take advantage of that. I'm still holding out hope for this year. So by Emerald okay. City Comic Con will be a really great time. I'm, I'm a little terrified. Our governor is going to do an announcement later this week, which just fills right. me with concern. <laughs> well, so for everyone listening, I might be doing a signing at Purchase Shop. I think we'll have a face reveal yes. that time, but we'll see what the governor says. 
There you go. Well, I mean, <laughs> yet, businesses are obviously opening. It's just, God, do you want to jump in at this exact moment? This is the business part of me that's worrying about the risk. But one yeah. way or another, we're, we're doing that or we'll have a, a nice, you know, round of drinks in a bar with a paper bag and over the head. That sounds great. Sounds good. All right, man. Well, thank you for letting me uh, take over your show. And thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks. Hope everybody enjoyed that. And we'll do this again real soon. Yep. Everybody hit me up with some, well, write some questions down. If you want me to dig into perch about some things in the future, let him know and he'll keep a list. If you want me to break through that NDA thing of his, let me, I can take another run at him. We can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll make, I'll make a list. Trust me. I'm making a list. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Sean. You have a great right. time in New York city. Have a good night, man. Thanks.